We now move to questions for the Communities Minister, and I call Kate Nicholl. Mr Speaker, addressing poverty in all its forms is a key priority for me. Poverty is a complex and multifaceted issue, and I am considering work to date on the development of the Executive's anti-poverty strategy. My officials have engaged with officials from all departments, including the Department of Education, in the development of the strategy so far. I have had discussions with the Minister for Education on childcare and, in particular, on the relationship between the anti-poverty strategy and the childcare strategy, and I will be working closely with him to progress both these important pieces of work. There are clear links between the two strategies. I and my executive colleagues will seek to ensure alignment of approach between the strategies in addressing the issues faced by children and their parents, with a view to ensuring all parents who want to work are enabled to do so. I am committed to developing solutions to tackle poverty in the here and now. I do not want to produce a strategy that will simply just sit on a shelf. To that end, my focus will be on working with my executive colleagues to develop a sustainable, deliverable anti-poverty strategy which prioritises the issues that will make a tangible difference to people's lives. Kate Nicholl. Thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that childcare cost um, uh, support under universal credit is only available if you are in work or about to start work. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment um, as to whether support could be, this support could be available for parents um, and carers who have disabilities or medical needs which prevent them from accessing the support um, with childcare costs? Thank Minister. you. Minister. Um, so, Mr Speaker, the member is uh, correct. The universal credit awards can include a childcare element in the calculation of the benefit award, and this can provide help with up to 85 per cent reimbursement of eligible uh, amount that the customer claims. Uh, the current maximum limits are £950, 91 pence for one child and £1,630 and 15 pence for two or more children. And, uh, she's correct to say that the claimant uh, must be in paid work, employed or self-employed or about uh, to start work. Uh, the difficulty for this department comes if there is divergence uh, from the rest of the uh, United Kingdom. That's where the extra costs uh, come in. Um, but I am aware of the, specific, um, uh, of the issues around the specific question uh, that she raises, and there is additional support that will be available for carers that find themselves uh, in that position. In terms of a child with a disability, an extra monthly payment is also available to help with the extra costs of bringing up a disabled child. And the disabled child edition will be paid at either a lower or higher uh, rate. And the lower rate is £146.31 uh, per month for a child who receives any rate of either part of DLA, um, except the highest rate of care part, or receives any rate of either uh, PIP, uh, uh, except the enhanced rate of the daily uh, living part. And the higher rate, £456.89, is for a child who receives the highest rate of the care part of uh, DLA. Um, as well as that, there's the Universal Credit Carers uh, Edition, £185 extra a month if uh, the person uh, tells us they are caring for a severely disabled uh, person. Colin Golden uh, Minister, will you give a commitment to factor in the recommendations of the Controller and Auditor General's report on child poverty uh, issued today before finalising the anti poverty strategy? Minister. The member will be aware that that report has only just been published today, and I will want to take time to uh, consider its findings and to get fully briefed by officials on that issue. Uh, I recognise that a number of concerns have been expressed in relation uh, to that report. Um, we are not going to have uh, a child poverty strategy in the future, as this will be, be ruled in uh, to the anti-poverty strategy, but of course it is absolutely right that we take time to consider that, look at the uh, learning that can be taken uh, from that. Um, I think it is important that we do that. It is important that we go out and try and find a way to ensure that we have a strategy that actually works, that will actually deliver the change that we want to see. And so that includes uh, taking learning from all quarters. Um, does the minister agree that the key to tackling poverty is getting people into work and ensuring that there is affordable, accessible childcare available for parents to do so? Minister. 
Yes, well, Mr. Speaker, the member will not be uh, surprised to hear me say that I uh, agree with her uh, that those who can work should be supported uh, into work, uh, and that means that we need to break down um, barriers um, to get people uh, into employment. Now, there are, there are a number of barriers that people face as they try to enter uh, the workplace, and she has rightly identified childcare as one of those barriers, and I am very keen. Uh, that that is an issue that this executive uh, addresses. Uh, she will be aware that the Education Minister takes primary responsibility uh, for this issue, and he is com committed uh, to getting this addressed. And my department will, of course, have a role uh, to play in that, and we'll be part of the task and finishing group uh, in relation to childcare policy proposals. Um, of course, that's not the only issue that we need to uh, address. Disability uh, is another barrier. Uh, and we have very low levels of employment for those who have a disability. I want to make sure uh, that we're doing everything that we can to ensure that a disability does not prohibit somebody from getting into the workplace, and some excellent work has already been done in that regard. I think it's also important that people have access to uh, training uh, and the skills that they need to succeed. Uh, but in all of this, um, Mr. Speaker, it will require uh, across a departmental uh, approach and genuine uh, joined up working so we can tackle poverty in all its forms in Northern Ireland. Call Jim Allister. How does the Minister think that those who need a fully funded child care scheme and indeed other strategies uh, would fail if this executive were to prioritise tens of millions more in the Casement Park? while strategies such as that go underfunded? Minister. So the member will be aware that there are a number of outstanding issues in relation to Casement Park redevelopment. There has been an executive commitment from 2011 for £62.5 million pounds for the redevelopment of Casement Park. Uh, however, um, I completely uh, agree with those uh, who are saying that we need to also uh, see our public services uh, funded uh, properly and that we also need to see a childcare uh, strategy in place and a childcare strategy that actually delivers uh, the change that is needed in order for people uh, to be able to get into work and not be burdened uh, by the cost of uh, childcare. Uh, that's what me and um, my party uh, are committed to doing and we look forward to achieving that during this term. Justin McNulty. Mr. Furs answers this far. Minister, what conversations have you had with the Department for Education and the Minister there in relation to the reality whereby hard working couples have had to make a decision or having to make a decision crippled with the, the burden of childcare costs and hiking childcare costs that they're making a the decision that one of the either the mother or father are having to stop work? What advice would you give them? Well, as, as I indicated in my original answer to uh, Ms Nickel, um, we have had conversations between myself and the Education Minister in relation to childcare. As I have said, it is primarily the responsibility of the Department for Education, but this will be a cross-cutting issue, and I'm determined uh, that my department will play its role uh, in delivering and this much-needed help. There is uh, no disagreement uh, between parties within the executive on the need to get this done and to get this done um, quickly. We know that this can be a major uh, game changer for people in Northern Ireland and, as we have discussed, the ability to get people into work. Uh, so that is something that um, I'm fully committed to playing uh, my uh, role in. Um, and we certainly will be listening uh, to those stakeholders, listening to those uh, parents uh, and coming up with, with what we can uh, to provide that real and meaningful help to people in Northern Ireland. Moving on then to question two, to call Liz Kimmons. Well, question two, please. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as I advised at question time on the 20th of February, uh, the scheme of emergency financial assistance was introduced by the executive in 2007. Its purpose is to provide immediate financial support to households who have suffered from flooding. It is not a compensation scheme, nor does it purport to be one nor is it intended to replace or displace the assistance that households should receive from their insurers. An immediate payment of £1,000 was made via district councils 
to provide eligible householders with assistance to make their homes habitable as quickly as possible. In Newry, Moran and Down District Council area, assistance was provided to 119 households during the flooding event in October 2023. No further payments under the SEFA can be made available. My department can only work within the guidelines that are available at this time. I recognise that there is uh, an issue of concern, especially for people whose homes have been flooded in the past, and the difficulty that there can be in securing flood insurance. Uh, flood RE is a joint initiative between the UK government and insurers, which will run until 2039. And that programme exists to improve the availability and affordability of flood insurance for people who live in properties in flood risk areas. Ms. Can call on. I thank the Minister for his answer, although I can sense that I probably am like a broken record at this stage and I, and I understand um, what the information has been provided, but I cannot stress strongly enough how critical this situation is. So I would ask the Minister to please consider a bespoke scheme that will deliver for those families that haven't had insurance, haven't been able to access flood insurance and are trying to rebuild their homes and haven't been able to do so. Um, it is a very critical situation and I would ask the Minister to strongly reconsider that. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member will understand that my hands are, are tied uh, in many ways here in so far as I can only operate within the scheme that is currently available. I have huge sympathy with those who find themselves in the position that she has uh, described. Uh, I think on average it costs between 40 and 50,000 pounds uh, to um, repair and uh, refurbish a home that has been damaged uh, by flooding. Um, that is something which is very, very hard on the uh, householder, but unfortunately that is not a cost that my department is able to absorb uh, at this time. Moving forward, I, I, I really would encourage the member to make her constituents that have been affected aware of the flood re uh, scheme. There is a levy that is taken from all insurance payments in the uh, UK that can go towards helping those that are in these areas and people who have faced this difficulty in the past uh, as well. But the Assembly is not in a position where it can uh, step in and provide that sort of cover that otherwise would um, be covered by insurance. Uh, can I have a and thank the Minister for his answers. Minister, uh, over this past number of years, there have been uh, several significant flooding incidents across the Foyle constituency. Uh, can the Minister indicate how much uh, funding has been paid out uh, from his department over the last five years within the London and Strabane Council area? Minister. Uh, yes, Mr um, Speaker, I can. In the London and Strabane uh, Council area um, in 2019-20, there were payments of £14,000 paid out, the following year £19,000, the following year £15,000, uh, the following year 2022 23 was £156,000 and the year after that was £23,000. Uh, those are that's just the support that was given through this uh, particular scheme, but I do want to put on uh, record uh, my thanks uh, to those in his local council area that did so much to help people that were affected during that time. Uh, the member will be aware of how the local community uh, came together, uh, how the council provided additional support on top of the support that was provided through uh, the department. Um, I know. Um, because of some connections I have in the Eglinton area, that local churches and community groups in particular uh, came together to uh, provide uh, that support. Uh, I don't believe that the department is able to provide all the help, uh, support and funding that is required in a situation like this, but I am pleased uh, that over the last number of years we have been able to provide £227,000 of support to help those uh, that find themselves in that uh, immediate uh, need, and that will continue uh, to be the case as we move forward. Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, um, would the Minister consider maybe evaluating that scheme and its effectiveness given uh, that there is an increase in the number of instances of floods and also that these floods are taking place in newer places where they haven't experienced floods before, such as my constituents in Cathedral View and Cathedral Park and Downpatrick, who are now being hit with very high insurance premiums, um, even though their houses weren't flooded? M Minister. Yes. Mr. Speaker, and I would uh, also say to the member that I hope that he would share with his constituents that the flood re scheme that can also be beneficial to them in the situation that they uh, find themselves. Uh, in regards to the scheme itself, um, any change to that scheme is likely to incur additional costs for which there's no 
budget available uh, at this moment in time, and any change to widen the application of the scheme is likely um, to impact the value for money uh, assessment of this scheme and, and be repercussive as well. So that would need to be fully tested via an appropriate business case, and, and no further work is done on that. The member does raise an important point in regards to how often these events are happening, and that they're happening in places that didn't happen uh, before. And um, I think there is a responsibility on this assembly and on the executive to make sure there is investment um, where that can make a difference in terms of flood uh, defences and preventative work uh, as well. And I will certainly uh, support the Department of Infrastructure uh, in that um, because I would be quite happy if this department did not pay out uh, anything um, from that fund because it wasn't needed. Um, but we will need an awful lot of investment um, if that is to be the case. Moving on, Connie Egan. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my officials have been working closely with Ards and North Down Borough Council and the developer Bangor Marine to bring forward plans for the development of the site by way of a development uh, agreement. I do want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to officials from uh, the Department for Communities who have worked very hard on this uh, over uh, very many years. The Bangor Marine team is currently working through the pre-commencement planning conditions and in tandem discussions are continuing uh, with the Crown Estate in relation to securing the necessary approvals for elements of the project located on Crown Estate land. Bangor Marine has started clearing trees and shrubbery from the marine gardens part of the site in advance of the nesting season to accommodate commencement of the construction of the public realm works which are programmed to begin later this year. This will provide an economic boost to the wider Ards and North Down economy through increased tourism, city centre living and increased employment opportunities. Thank you, Minister. Um, the Queen's Parade site in Bangor has been derelict since before I was even born. It's something that people in Bangor are very keen to see happen. Um, unfortunately, it has been plagued by delays. It says on your own uh, website that works were expected to start in summer 2023. When can we expect building to take place? And can you give the people of Bangor hope that you'll prioritise this? Minister. Well, uh Mr. Speaker, I always hope that I can give the people of Bangor hope, uh, hopefully in many different ways uh, in uh, the remainder of my time uh, in office. Um, but first of all, I would say I completely understand the frustration in and around um, this uh, site. Um, this has been going on, as the members indicated, uh, for many decades. And it is something um, that I know people in the area have um, wanted to see progress for a long time. She will be uh, aware of the negotiations, that I, as I would mentioned, with the uh, Crown uh, Estate. Um, that has been somewhat protracted, have gone on a lot longer than any of us uh, would have liked. And that could push back the planned uh, start date in, in this summer. However, she will be aware of the works that have taken place uh, so far. And, um, I can give her uh, an assurance that this will be pushed forward um, from the part of my department as, as, as quickly as possible. I'm delighted um, that I'm going to be visiting uh, very, very soon um, to see for myself the, the work that is going to uh, be done. I think it was on uh, my first or second day in office, Mr Dunn extended an invitation for me to uh, come uh, and visit. So I look forward to uh, seeing uh, that and to, to, to see the potential, um, because I think this absolutely could be a, a game changer and bring significant uh, economic and social benefits, um, not just for uh, the people of Bangor, but even uh, more widely. All the chambers. I certainly uh, welcome the uh, comments of the, the minister uh, so far, but can I ask him, have any time limits uh, been incorporated in the contract with the developer uh, to ensure that uh, various stages of the project are actually completed on time? Sure. Um, I'm not aware of any hard and fast dates that have been put in to ensure that this is completed. Obviously, the, the target date is um, spring uh, 2027. I certainly hope that that work can be progressed and finished. But like I said in my answer to uh, Ms Egan, I will do uh, everything that I can from where the department has responsibility to make sure that this is moved on uh, as quickly as possible because I, I understand the benefits uh, that this can bring and I want people to, to enjoy those as soon as possible. Daniel McCrossan. Mr Speaker, Minister, could you provide an update on the regeneration of Strabane Town Centre and what progress was made in the public realm scheme? Uh, yes, um, Mr Speaker, uh, I can. 
Um, I know that this has also been uh, another area um, that has been some time in, in the making. Um, the Strabane Public Realm project is at business case stage and is now scheduled for casework committee consideration within my department. There have been a number of iterations of the business case and my officials have been working closely with Londonderry and Strabane District Council in getting the business case finalised for casework consideration over the past months. The project is of a scale that will require my approval as well as Department of Finance approval and in consideration of this project I will want to consider the budget requirements alongside other capital funding priorities within my department. Owen Tennyson. Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, phase one of my department's programme of private rented sector reform already includes work to improve security of tenure through the introduction of much longer notice to quit periods via the Private Tenancies Act Northern Ireland 2002. The Act also specifies that regulations on exemptions must be in place before these longer notice periods are commenced. This is because without such exceptions the legislation would be susceptible to challenges under Article 1, Protocol 1 of the Human Rights Act 1998 regarding interference with the control of use of property. My officials have taken on board the views of stakeholders and are developing a robust equality impact assessment to inform the drafting of these regulations with consultation planned for in the coming months. In parallel, I am considering what phase two of the private rented sector reform programme should include. I am conscious that the reform programme began with a review that is now over eight years old, so I have asked my officials to re-engage with key stakeholders to refresh our thinking on what the most impact on improving the safety, security and standards of the private sec rented sector could be. Mr. Tennyson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that almost 2,900 households presented as homeless due to loss of rented accommodation in 22-23, a 17% 17 increase, 17 increase on the prior year. It, it, as part of his consideration, is the Minister looking to Scotland in terms of indefinite tenancy, and does he also agree that any exemptions need to be tightly defined so that uh, renters don't find themselves at the, at the um, disposal of unscrupulous landlords? Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, the priority for the department is to implement and put in place the changes that have been made and requested by this assembly in 2022 with the act that went through uh, the House. Uh, any further work will be given due consideration uh, in time. Uh, however, I do understand the concerns that he has in both England and Wales, where they have mo moved to that um, no-fault eviction ban. There are quite a few and indeed a growing number of exemptions uh, to that. And so uh, I believe that the department and, and this house will need to be very careful um, in um, any move towards that. Um, um, what we all want is the right outcome for uh, our constituents, and that will all be taken into consideration. Horace Bradley. I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Does the Minister agree with me that it's a disgraceful if landlords use notices to quit? instead of addressing complaints from tenants such as damp, mould and necessary uh, repairs? Sure. Yes, um, Mr Speaker, that, that I absolutely do uh, agree with uh, Mr Bradley, and that is why there has been um, the need for this legislation, the potential for more legislation as well. It is not appropriate for a landlord to simply issue a notice to quit because uh, a tenant is asking um, for improvements or, or, or reasonable measures uh, to be taken. Um, I would also say uh, to the member that council and environmental health officers have power to deal with damp and associated mould issues uh, that are prejudi prejudicial to health through enforcing the statutory minimum fitness standard uh, for housing, and that's applicable to all tenures. Cathy Misson. Number five, please. Mr. Be aware that the Living High Streets initiative is a community-led approach to placemaking that brings people together to consider their local high streets, tackle common issues and enable places and communities to thrive. It's an initiative that was led by the Ministerial Advisory Group for Architecture and the Built Environment with the production of the Living High Streets Craft Kit. And this was piloted in Downpatrick 
and led by the Regeneration Steering Group there, which is made up of local businesses, community and political leaders. Uh, the Department would very much like to be in a position to provide further financial support uh, moving forward. Uh, any further resource support will be subject to the necessary budget being made available. Ms. Wilson. Um, Minister, um, you will be aware, and as you've said, that the Downpatrick Regeneration Working Group have been working tirelessly there with representatives from your department and, of course, the, the local council there to create this framework and division, or vision for Downpatrick. I understand that it's, there's budgetary constraints, but will you prioritise Downpatrick if a funding package does become available? Minister. Well, look, we, we've certainly seen the, the benefit of this uh, moving forward, and I would, I would very much likely like to be in that position to provide uh, further financial support. And once my, um, the budget outcome is, is known, I hope that, that that will be the case, but the members put her uh, concern on the record. Brian Kingston. Speaker, and I wish to ask the Minister, does his department have any other plans for further pilots to take forward the Crafts Kit scheme, uh, including in North Belfast? Minister. Well, it's funny the member should ask uh, because the department is currently working with the Greater Shankill Partnership, the Better Understanding and Local Development Group, and other key statutory organisations and stakeholders in the Greater Shankill area to take forward a further pilot of the craft kit subject to resources and also to demonstrate its use uh, in a setting such as the arterial route into Belfast. Question six has been withdrawn. I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Question number seven. Minister. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to group questions seven and nine together. In determining whether an assembly question is operational, consideration is given to whether the question is about the day to day running of an arm's length body, advisory group, or other public body with links to the department. The aim is to provide clear delineation between my department's responsibilities in terms of policy development and operational delivery by ALBs and other relevant public bodies. It aligns to the principles of ALB partnership arrangements. Final decisions are made by me as Minister for Communities in approving answers prior to issue. Mr. Durkin. I thank the Minister for his answer. I was half expecting him to give me the Housing Executive's phone number. Because <laughs> within the first month of taking office, the Minister has referred 78 Assembly questions to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, that's not to mention Sport NI or the Arts Council. Does the Minister think this is acceptable? Does this make him accountable? And has he any plans to review this practice? Minister. No, I have no plans to review uh, this practice because I want Assembly members to get the information in the most timely uh, way possible. There is, of course, precedent uh, for this um, in the rest of the United Kingdom. Parliament will often, parli ministers in Parliament will often refer questions uh, to um, outside organisations uh, as well. So the member can either take the approach of writing to the housing executive and asking for the information, or he can go down uh, a longer route and a more costly route. He can go down that route, which is to go to the Assembly Business Office which takes the question and sends it to the DFC private office that commissions um, a lead business area within DFC. The lead business area will then contact the ALB to request specific information. The ALB then gathers information and provides it to the DFC business area. And then the business area will draft the response on the basis of the info provided by the ALB. The draft answer then goes through the official level processes. The draft answer is then provided to the private office. It's then reviewed uh, by a SPAD, if, if I had one, and then it's approved by the Minister, and then it's issued by the DFC private office to MLA and Assembly uh, business office. So it's very simple uh, and straightforward. Uh, do you want the information as soon and as quickly as you can get it in the most efficient way, or do you want to go through that whole uh, palaver in order uh, to get it? And if the member is serious uh, 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 about um, uh, getting that information as quickly as possible, he'll want to go through uh, the, the, the previous route. I do have to say, though, I find it interesting that the SDLP announced that they were going into opposition and said, we will provide a new type of politics that addresses the problems facing parents and families across our communities. But both of the questions that they have listed for answer today are, are about the internal processes of this assembly. Clara Hunter. Speaker, just on that point and seeking uh, clarity for those families and our constituents, uh, was the Minister's predecessor doing something wrong by answering members' questions and referring zero questions to the House and Executive during her last two years in office? 
Minister, I'm not saying that the, me that the previous minister was doing anything wrong, but I certainly believe the approach that I have taken will ensure that the member gets her answer much more quickly and that there will be less pressure uh, on uh, my uh, departmental uh, resources uh, as well. But I do think it is interesting that the member uh, has come along uh, today to ask uh, this, this question, and she hasn't uh, decided to ask a question about housing, uh, about poverty, or about sports provision, uh, or about homelessness. Order or about regeneration or a disability uh, support. It's a, it's a process issue, and that's what the SDLP seem most concerned about. That concludes uh, the questions. We move to topical questions, and I call Daniel McCrossan. Mr. McCrossan. Mr. McCrossan. Very sorry. Mr. Speaker, I was caught off guard in the moment there. <laughs> this is disturb you. Um, Minister, in light of uh, your department having approximately 700 fewer staff than needed, will you be drawing up a workforce succession plan to manage the recruitment and retention problems, consequent skill set deficit and significant number of temporary promotions currently being experienced? Thank you. Mr Speaker, Mr. that has of course been identified as a problem. Uh, it's something that I want to uh, see addressed and ensure that we have the right number of staff in place so that we can fully deliver uh, on the um, aims and objectives of my department. Mr. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, at the Communities Community, we were told that the recruitment, a recruitment pause, temporary promotions, and staff leaving the department has exacerbated a, prob a major problem within the department, particularly in developing strategies or getting them completed. When will the Minister publish an action plan to turn the staff crisis in his department around? Minister. Uh, in response to the member, I said I, I, I don't have that uh, in front of me. I don't have that detail now, but I do want to assure the member that I do uh, have concerns over that. We need a properly resourced department, uh, and we'll take the necessary steps to try to achieve that. I call Cheryl Brownlee. Speaker, and to the Minister, I would ask, in light of the shockingly low 10% um, success rate um, of, of applicants to the Arts Council marching band scheme, um, could he provide an update on funding for this financial year and also for the future? Minister. Yes. Um, Mr Speaker, in this financial year, 23-24, £400,000 was allocated to the Musical Instruments Programme. And of that, 200,000 was awarded to 23 bands uh, right across Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that following a reallocation exercise as we approach the year end, I am able to allocate a further 100,000 pounds this year to the Musical Instruments Programme. The Arts Council had already assessed the applications and have now worked through the reserve list. I expect a further eight bands will now benefit from the decision that I have made and I look forward to visiting some of those who have benefited uh, from this programme. In terms of future funding, this will be dependent on my department's funding allocation and budget for the next financial year. However, I recognise the importance um, of such uh, funding to bands, and I hope to be in a position next year to offer further support. Mr. Um, thank you, and thank you to the Minister. Um, I, of course, welcome his update. Does the Minister agree that marching bands make a very positive contribution within our communities right across Northern Ireland? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I absolutely uh, agree that bands make an important uh, contribution, and in a number uh, of ways. Um, it gives many young people an opportunity uh, to get involved. Uh, some will have no or little musical uh, experience and they can become proficient. Um, I think you also find uh, that these young people and others come from all sorts of socio-economic backgrounds uh, as well. Uh, the bands can help to give people a real sense of belonging and uh, community. And I know in particular from experience in my own constituency, and I'm sure that other members will uh, agree, uh, the bands were an incredible support uh, to local uh, communities during the uh, pandemic. Um, they're also uh, a vehicle by which important issues um, uh, can be raised. I, I think of uh, Cairn Castle Flute Band and my own constituency that a number of years ago uh, did a lot of work in raising awareness of mental health issues that many in the community uh, face. So from an individual point of view and a, a community point of view, um, it's, a, it's a great way of getting uh, more people uh, involved and getting more people involved uh, in the arts. I would also want to take the opportunity um, to put on uh, record my thanks to the many people who are involved, who are nearly all volunteers, uh, who do uh, a brilliant job uh, right across Northern Ireland. 
Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister give an update on matters that he may have raised with the UK Sports Minister in his recent visit to Northern Ireland, and in particular, any discussions in regard to the delivery of the sub-regional sports stadium project? Minister, well, the member will be uh, aware that the command paper uh, stated that there would be a meeting that would take place uh, between the Communities Minister and the UK Sports Minister within a month of uh, the Assembly returning. That happened last uh, Monday. I was very pleased to uh, welcome the Minister to Northern Ireland and to take him around a number of different uh, clubs uh, in Northern Ireland to see uh, the amount of investment that is going to be required to bring those clubs uh, up to standard. Uh, the Minister will be writing to the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister um, outlining um, the uh, visit and the actions that need to be uh, taken. And uh, I look forward to further uh, action and investment to ensure that we can bring uh, our clubs up to standard. Mr. Butler. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, uh, can the Minister point out if any additional funding request is sought of the Sports Minister in regard to the delivery of sub regional steady projects? And would like to offer the opportunity for the Minister, if he hasn't yet visited the Lisbon Rangers and uh, Lagan Valley Lisbon with me, uh, done so so far, to, to visit with myself. Minister. So, um, I raised this issue with the Sports Minister. Every club that I visited with the Sports Minister raised this issue with him uh, as well. And he was very clear with me on departing that he had heard the message loud and clear about the need for more investment in our sports infrastructure uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. Um, I'm more than happy to accept the member's uh, invitation. I think nearly every um, football ground in the country has invited me to uh, come and visit. And so if, if the clubs mentioned are not already on the list, I'll be happy to add them to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister be aware of a recent Trussell Trust uh, report that states 62% of people on universal credit in Northern Ireland have fallen behind on their bills, given the, um, the lack of uptake of the contingency fund. Um, can the Minister outline what his department will do to um, create awareness of that to those who are especially experiencing that five week wait? Minister. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of the specific figure that the member created. I know there was uh, a survey, I think, carried out uh, among, um, maybe, I think it was maybe 100 people in, in Northern Ireland. I'm not sure if that's from the, from the same uh, survey. But certainly from my point of view, I want to make sure that people are getting uh, what they are entitled to. And I would um, hope that the member would refer uh, people to the department's Make the Call service as well, so that people uh, are getting the support that they're entitled to. Ms. Mulholland. And on, and on that, in terms of the mitigation um, that, that we're facing, obviously, a cliff edge when we come to um, 2025, can the Minister outline any plans to, um, to work against that and to, to put in place support for people who might be facing that cliff edge? Well, I'm, Minister. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the difficulties that many are facing and the additional help that will be required. I'm waiting on an, uh, a report to come forward in terms of those mitigations and then we'll need to develop, develop a plan on the way forward. That plan will require a budget and, and executive uh, support, but I can assure the member it's very much on my radar. Hi, Harvey. Thank you. Mr Speaker, can the Minister outline what current investment is required within the Northern Ireland Housing Executive to bring it up to standard? Minister. Well, the short answer, Mr Speaker, is a lot. Um, the Housing Executive faces uh, significant investment challenges. Uh, the 30-year requirement was updated via a stock validation report in 2021 and estimated to be £10.3 billion in 2022 prices. Uh, this reflects the cost of addressing the backlog and maintenance, uh, ongoing stock maintenance and investment, and the costs associated um, with decarbonisation and retrofit. An outline business case has been developed which identifies a preferred option to tackle the significant investment challenge and to put the Northern Ireland Housing Executive onto a sustainable footing. And officials are in the process of testing the assumptions made within the outline business case and around access to borrowing. Mr Harvey. And thank you for your answers, Minister. Minister, what actions will you undertake to try and meet these funding challenges and help address the shortage of social housing in Strangford? Minister. Yeah, well, um, Mr Speaker, there is a, a serious issue uh, of concern here, and from my own point of view, the current situation is not tolerable uh, beyond the short term. And the additional problem that we have is that the investment challenge is getting worse uh, with every year uh, that passes. So I want to put the um, 
housing executives 82,000 homes onto a much more sustainable footing so that tenants have confidence that we're able to keep them safe, uh, warm and dry in the long term. This will take a substantial injection of funds and so subject to agreement by His Majesty's Treasury, uh, I would like to see the housing executive have the same access to borrowing as social landlords in the rest of the UK and I believe that this uh, is necessary and I believe that it can be transformational. Question six and seven have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Honeyford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I've previously asked the minister, I've been torturing the minister around questions for sub-regional and, and separately importantly, because it's been mentioned some clubs that aren't actually able to get sub-regional around grassroots sports clubs. So can the minister outline what capital funding is, will be coming forward for grassroots clubs in the next uh, financial year? Minister. Yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, over the last uh, three financial years, Sport NI has issued exchequer funding of almost £39.4 million and lottery funding of just over £17 million. This funding consisted of 3,394 grant awards to over 1,900 uh, organisations, including grassroots sport and sports governing uh, bodies. Uh, this year, uh, Sport NI will have invested 37 point Sorry, £7.1 million of national lottery funding to 37 sports governing bodies. And we have an ambition to boost that next year to over £8 million and um, £1.37 million of capital funding uh, to improve sports facilities, including those that will benefit grassroots clubs. Uh, in terms of funding paid this year to the sports governing bodies, and by way of comparison, across some of the sports governing bodies, um, I can advise that the IFA received 500,000, Ulster GAA 440, Ulster Rugby 450, um, Golf 264, and Tennis 52,000. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I think we all uh, want to see the support for our grassroots clubs and, and that capital availability. I have previously raised with Sport NI and his own department around creating a, a grassroots sports fund that would be open to all sports, would help empower the local club and realise their own vision. Can I ask the Minister if he would meet with me to discuss this issue and look at more detail to look at create such a fund that we can increase and expand the amount of funding that grassroots sports no. gets? No, sir. Absolutely, um, Mr. Speaker. I'm more than happy to uh, meet with the member, indeed any member, to discuss um, these issues because uh, I think it is critically important. I know there has been a huge underinvestment in uh, grassroots sport and sporting facilities for, for many, many years. Uh, I believe that sport has the power to be transformational. Uh, I think that sport gets more people active, gets more people working together, and creates better opportunities for our young people as well, which then will take off pressure in future years on the health system, on the justice system and on other departments that are short uh, of money. This is a type of early intervention that really pays off and it's one that I, I fully support and I'll be happy to work with them on that. Cathy Mason. Cancorlia. Um, Minister, during the recent uh, flooding incidents in South Down, um, a number of our sporting facilities were damaged during this time. Do you have any plans to provide these clubs with any financial assistance or help um, to try and get them back on their feet? Minister. Um, although I don't have any specific um, uh, plans around that at this stage, if there are certain facilities that have been, been damaged uh, in that way, uh, I'm more than happy for the member to bring details of those uh, to me to see what support my department or its ALBs might be able to provide. Ms. Mason. Uh, Minister, I appreciate that. Um, and it's just, have you any plans in the longer term to work directly with our local councils to review our community sporting facilities, um, specifically in our rural areas um, and areas of deprivation? Well, Mr. Sure. Speaker, I've outlined to uh, Mr. Honeyford uh, already um, the emphasis and the importance that I place on, on sport and having appropriate sporting uh, facilities. Um, I think there should be um, a great working partnership between councils and DFC and Sport NI and also our schools as well who can play an important role in ensuring that there is appropriate provision there uh, for uh, young people and indeed those that would not find themselves in, in that category uh, to be able to, to place uh, sport. Um, so that is something that I, I will be progressing and I'm more than happy to work with the um, council that the member lives in or indeed any other council across Northern Ireland. All in chambers. In a pressure of time, I'll move straight to the supplementary. 
Uh, it's in relation to the regional and sub-regional stadia programmes. Uh, Minister, the sheer scale of additional capital funding been quoted for both is beyond what the executive can credibly fund in the context of the reported budget landscape. Can I ask the minister for his assessment of this? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, er, I've been on record saying um, that the funds that were set aside for the sub-regional football uh, stadia uh, was not sufficient. Um, I don't think it comes close uh, to meeting the need that exists uh, out there. Um, I think it was a small enough pot of £36.2 million in 2011. Um, I think that is uh, uh, an even smaller amount now uh, in relative terms. Uh, so that's why I've taken the action to speak directly uh, to the UK uh, Sports Minister. And I will, of course, be engaging with executive colleagues uh, to make sure that we have the funding um, that is necessary in order for these plans to proceed. That concludes. Uh, qu qu Point of order, Mr. Turkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of openness, transparency, and full accountability for public funds, can the Speaker advise if it is in order for ministers to abdicate responsibility for answering members' questions, reasonable requests for information to other agencies and arm's length bodies funded by their respective departments? And could the Minister or Speaker perhaps issue guidance to members and to ministers as to what constitutes a reasonable request for information under their respective departments uh, remit and responsibility? I well, thank the member for um, the point of order. I anticipated that there might be a, a question on us, having reviewed the questions before today's proceedings. Standard orders are pretty straightforward. They provide that a member may ask questions of a minister on matters relating to the minister's official responsibilities. Standard orders also provide that a question must be answered as clearly and fully as possible. Therefore, if a question on a matter relating to a minister's responsibilities there is a duty on the minister to provide a full answer to it. It is not in order to avoid answering by advising members to send an email to someone else instead. I want to emphasise um, that uh, or I want to emphasise a point to all ministers, um, because it does, doesn't include one. They are required to be accountable to this House and this Assembly, and I will not accept any attempts to evade this responsibility. I am not familiar with specific questions, however I am aware that previous Ministers for Communities and before them Ministers for Social Development all treated questions about the Housing Executive as matters relating to their official responsibilities and therefore answered them directly. I have not been informed of any reason um, why there should be any change to this approach. I therefore appreciate the Member's frustration, which is now on the record, and uh, I will uh, be, have an expectation uh, that the duty uh, set out in Standing Order 19.5 is adhered to in ministers answering questions to members. We now move on uh, to the motion on workers' rights, and I call Sinead McLaughlin.